just shared screen. Looks good to me. Great. Well, yeah, thank you, Connie, and to the organizers. Uh, this is a, a really great event that you all have put together. I'm really eager to, to jump into dialogue with you all. Um, and, you know, I was tr trying to think about how I was framing my talk tonight. I was thinking there's a lot of, there will be a lot of talk on action in this dialogue that we're having. So I want to talk a little more about sort of the inner work of climate change, the inner work that brings us to this work or maybe that prevents us from engaging in it. And I'm a writer and so I'm gonna read something I've written and then I'll also begin to share slides and tell stories from my, from my travels uh, of folks who are engaged in action. So that's kind of how I wanna spend the time here. I'm trying to slick, switch to the next slide and it's not letting so me do click that. On it, click on it, Fred, and then your down button will look work. There we go. There you go. So before I jump right in, I want to do just a brief grounding moment. Uh, the title of my talk is Contemplative Ecology, and I want to just begin with a kind of contemplative moment. Uh, just acknowledging this is a, a you know a difficult uh, subject, and it brings up a lot of emotion. And so I wanna just begin by just asking you to, to take a moment, close your eyes or soften your gaze. And I'll just lead us in a, a very brief opening meditation. So as you sit here, I just want you to, invite you to take a breath, deep breath in, deep breath out. When we breathe deeply, we engage that parasympathetic nervous system, which calms us down, allows us to think. Just being aware of your breath right now in this moment. And as you're breathing, as you're sitting here, just become aware of your body resting on a chair, your feet grounded, the earth supporting you. Notice what feelings you have right now in this moment. Perhaps some excitement about the conference, perhaps some anxiety about what you might learn, perhaps fear, perhaps motivation, whatever you're feeling right now, just name that with a kind of non-judgmental curiosity. And as you breathe here in this moment too, I invite you to be aware of where God is in this moment for you and whatever language you use for God. How is God present for you in this moment? Breathing in, breathing out. Nowhere to go but here. Thank you for your attention. So I wanna jump right in here. We're gonna jump right into the deep end as it were. We have been here in Montana uh, this past month have been living in the effects of climate change. I remember the summer of 1988 when I lived in Bozeman which was the summer that Yellowstone burned, about a third of the park. And even as a 14 year old kid, I remember uh, just the air, the ash in the air, the, the sky turning dark, the, uh, the smell of smoke, the itchy nose, the runny nose, the itchy throat, the feeling of, I can't go outside, the feeling of depression, even as a 14 year old, I remember that. And I've thought about that many times in this past, uh, this past month when we here in Montana have been breathing the smoke and fires from Oregon, Washington, California, Idaho, thinking about the sadness of, of that time of not being able to go outside, not being able to exercise or carry on our normal lives. 
And of course, fire is a natural part of our ecosystem out west. But what is not natural is the climate forces that are driving those fires to become hotter and more intense and more frequent and for fire season to be longer than it should normally be. And so we're already feeling the effects of climate change. Climate change is that driver of hotter, more dangerous fires, just as it's a driver of the increased hurricanes that we've seen in the Gulf. And so this is our current moment that we begin with right here. We are in the early Anthropocene bottleneck, and I borrow this slide from a climate scientist friend of mine, Miles, si Miles Silman at Wake Forest University where I teach. And what we have here on the left is a normal, healthy, functioning ecosystem, a normal, healthy, functioning world where you have landscape heterogeneity and biotic mixing. You have ecological uh, heterogeneity and an abundance of species. And what we're doing through human action is we're moving into this bottleneck. And here in the middle, you can see the pressures of human action. That's land use, such as deforestation and industrial agriculture, which pumps carbon into the atmosphere. And it's also our heavy fossil fuel use. Uh, those are the pressures that are constricting that bottleneck. But then we also have management responses, and those are the kind of blue shepherd's crooks that you see. And those are what allow us to pull that bottleneck back open. And so we're making choices right now. Do we want to constrict that bottleneck or do we want to pull it open? And the choices we're making now will determine what kind of world we have in the near future and for the next several thousand years at least. Do we have a diminished world there with far fewer species, drought, hurricanes, fires? Or do we have something in the middle or even something at the top that's a fully functioning, robust world like we have now? So these are choices that we're making. So climate change is not some abstraction. It's not uh, something distant that our grandchildren will face. It's something we're facing now. It's the smoke that we're breathing from California's fires. It's the fact that hurricane meteorologists had to start using Greek names for hurricanes for the second time ever in recorded history because there've been so many hurricanes this season, they've already run through the alphabet. It's become increasingly difficult not to see the effects of climate change. It's on the public record that ExxonMobil has known about climate change for decades. Its own scientists have known about this for decades. And it's not only withheld that information from the public, but it's paid former tobacco lobbyists to sow doubt in the public mind about the realities of global warming. Just as the tobacco companies long knew that their products were carcinogenic, but lied about it to the public. Perhaps this is why some people here in the US still talk about whether or not they quote, believe in, clim in climate change, which when you think about it is just as bizarre as talking about whether or not you believe in gravity. Maybe you don't believe in gravity, but if you jump off a tall building, I guarantee it's gonna rise up and slap you in the face. Climate change is not about belief. It's about chemistry and physics. And any politician or pundit who tries to cast doubt on the scientific consensus on climate change is simply lying to you. Which is why we can't talk about climate change in terms of solely personal responsibility. And I love seeing the, the word, uh, the word hoard there at the beginning of all the different things you all are doing. That's amazing, keep doing it. We all need to be doing those things, but we're not going to recycle our way out of this problem. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge to make real change, we have to make systemic change. The climate scientist and evangelical Christian Catherine Hayhoe says the most important thing any of us can do about climate change is to talk about it, which is exactly what we're doing here in this conference. We should also listen to the experts on climate change like Dr. Hayhoe, not pundits or politicians. We should listen, first of all, to the climate scientists themselves. And here's a picture of one, and I wanna show you a real live climate scientist here because climate scientists are not this sort of distant abstraction. They are real people doing real scientific work, peer reviewed work. 
This is my friend Miles Selman, who I had mentioned earlier, uh, one of the world's leading tropical ecologists. Miles works in the Amazon. He's discovered a whole species of tree like oak or maple. Uh, he's doing incredible work in the Amazon and is one of the world's leading climate scientists. And what Miles and other climate scientists tell us is that unless we act decisively and as a society, our world will become too warm to support human life. The consensus that Miles and other climate scientists have reached is that climate change is affecting us now in real time, first of all. Second, that humans are the primary cause, pumping our fossil fuels and our carbon into the atmosphere, also through our, our land use patterns. And then third, we need to act swiftly to avoid the worst effects of climate change. This is not rocket science. We can trust the scientific consensus on climate change. Why do we trust climate scientists, you might ask? Because in every other area of our life, we trust a scientific way of knowing. Here's an analogy I want to give you. So we know that insulin is secreted by the pancreas, OK? How do we know that? We guarantee none of us on this call, unless you're a medical doctor, have actually gone in and examined a cadaver to figure out that insulin is secreted by the pancreas. We, we know that because we trust the medical professionals who tell us that that's true. We know that insulin is not secreted by the femur or the kidney, right? We trust a scientific way of knowing. And so if the president of the United States were to suddenly proclaim, listen, everybody, insulin is not secreted by the pancreas, it's actually secreted by the femur. No, wait, actually, I changed my mind. Insulin is just a hoax. It's, there is no such thing as insulin. It's a hoax invented by the Chinese. Trust me, I'm a very smart guy. No, we would say, this is crazy talk. This is insane. Right? If the President of the United States or anyone were to start talking like this, we would say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. We would trust the people who do know what we're talking about, the medical professionals, just as we should trust climate scientists to tell us about climate. Now, this seems like a really basic point, but it's amazing the amount of disinformation and the number of people who still sort of doubt uh, the climate science consensus. So the picture before us is bleak, but it's not hopeless. And here's Dr. Catherine Hayhoe again. She says, we are not tied to the train tracks, helpless with the engine of climate change bearing down on us. We are in the engine room with our hand hard on the accelerator and we can take it off. I'll say that again, I, I think it's a great analogy. We are not tied to the train tracks, helpless with the engine of climate change bearing down on us. We are in the engine room. I'm gonna pivot, but before I pivot, whatever else I say tonight, just remember that voting out climate deniers in whatever party is the first thing we have to do if we want to make any kind of meaningful action on climate change. All the rest, it's just reshuffling the deck chairs back in the fourth car. Until we take our hand off the accelerator and remove the climate deniers from the engine room, we're all on the track for disaster. And we need to be really clear-eyed about that. But what about our day-to-day -day lives? And this is where I wanna pivot and talk about the inner work that we still all are faced with in the business of living in a world where climate change has already begun. As we've seen with fires and hurricanes, climate change is already here. How do we live with our anxiety? How do we live with the way that this is affecting our spiritual life, the way that it's affecting our relationships? Because climate change affects every area of our lives. It's not some abstract issue. And how can we turn that anxiety and grief into real meaningful social change? I wanna share some ideas from the psychologist, Dr. Renee Lertzman, who, is a, who has a brilliant talk, a TED talk called how to turn climate anxiety into action. Dr. Lertzman talks about how all of us have a certain window of tolerance for bad news. When confronted with the bad news of climate change, we have three possible responses. 
One response is to hide over in one side of the window. We get depressed. We think there's no hope to fix this. We fall into despair, we check out. That's the depression side of the window. The other side of the, of the window where we might hide is denial. Climate change couldn't possibly be real because of X, Y, or Z. God, God couldn't let this happen. Or nobody in my church or my circle of friends is talking about it, or my pastor doesn't preach about it, therefore it can't possibly be true. Denial. Now you have to give climate deniers some credit here because to stay in a state of denial when we've just come through the fires we've come through out west or any number of real-time actions on climate change where we're seeing it happen, to stay in a state of denial about that, you have to engage in all kinds of intellectual gymnastics just to keep that denial working for you. It actually takes a lot of energy to stay in denial. The problem with both despair and denial is that you're hiding over in one side of the window or the other, and you can't see clearly out the window of your own life. You can't look out on the world and see it with any clarity. You're trapped in a corner. And this is mostly where we are on a societal level. We're vacillating between denial and despair. And from the outside, it looks like collective apathy. And so to get back looking out of our window at the world, we need what Dr. Lertzman and other psychologists call attunement. We need to feel that our feelings are valid, that we are understood, that we're not going to be shamed for feeling depressed or shamed for feeling denial. Paradoxically, Dr. Lertzman says it's by owning up to our feelings around climate change that helps us become attuned. And once we become attuned, our imagination kicks in. And this is the really exciting part. When we give our, ourselves permission to be who we are, to admit our feelings of grief and anxiety, then we can relax and move into the executive level functioning of our brains. Instead of reacting from those lower mammalian fight or flight part of our brains, we can relax and engage the prefrontal cortex. We begin to make rational informed decisions. Our nervous system calms, our executive function can go to work solving problems. And this is where we become adaptive, resilient, and flexible, and creative, all those things that we need to tackle this problem together. And this is where the faith part of our faith science and climate action conversation really comes to the fore. Because every faith tradition has a focus on contemplation and prayer. And one of the many things contemplation does is help us become attuned. It helps us look out the window of our own lives again. What is contemplation? The definition I like is a long loving look at the real. A long loving look at the real. And when we do that, excuse me, a long loving look at the real is staring reality in the face and not looking away. And when we do that through the eyes of faith, that's called prayer. Sitting in prayerful contemplation with God and allowing God to rework us, to retune us, to let the scales fall from our eyes. I'm convinced that there is nothing more important right now than for people of faith to expand their prayers beyond the human realm and to look at this earth that we're on. If we're going to solve the climate crisis, we have to practice attuning ourselves to reality outside of our own private concerns. Scientific information is necessary, but that's not enough to motivate us to act. Science alone won't get us there. We need to open ourselves through our contemplative practice, through our prayer practice. In that, and in that space, we could admit our feelings of anxiety and despair and all the rest, and then we can let them go. We can practice self-compassion. Because let's face it, we're living through a crisis bigger than any human has ever faced before. The magnitude that we're up against is enormous. And so we have to practice attunement inside of ourselves before we can hope to change our climate crisis. This is how we begin to heal a spirit in disarray. 
And when we begin our own healing, we're better able to attune with others. Dr. Dan Siegel, a well-known neuropsychologist says, when we attune with others, we allow our own internal state to shift, to come to resonate with the inner world of another. What we're doing here in this conference, I think, is an example of social attunement. We're not just computers swapping information. We're creating unseen bonds that strengthen our resolve. And that's, what we need, that's where we need to be to confront the climate crisis. We need to all be in the middle of our window, looking out at the reality we face. Fully attuned, fully able to face whatever comes, and fully able to exercise our imaginations for collective action so that we can change the outcome that we're headed toward right now. So speaking of changing the outcome, I wanna pivot again to action. When we use our collective imaginations, we will quickly vote out the climate deniers. Whatever your party, whatever buttons I've triggered in you by my talk tonight, we have to vote out those who are not working 100% on solving this issue. As I said, all of the rest we can argue about in the years to come, but until we take our hand off the accelerator, we're not doing ourselves any good. So when we, when we use our imaginations, we vote out the climate deniers. We take back the control of the engine room, we take our hands off the accelerator, we put on the brakes, we start drawing carbon down. We start sequestering it in our fields and forests and farms. And so for the remaining time, I wanna show a few examples of people of faith who are doing just that. And it all starts with our imaginations. What this time asks of us, I think, is that we expand, we people of faith expand our spiritual imaginations and include an ecological imagination. We need to stretch the boundaries of what we consider spiritual. And when we do that, we begin to see that the whole world is holy and full of God's presence. This quote from one of my heroes, Pope Francis, I'm not Catholic, but I love this guy to death. I, I, he makes me want to be Catholic. Uh, I think he's one of the boldest, uh, most faithful Christian leaders in my lifetime, certainly. Pope Francis says, soil, water, mountains, everything is a caress of God. Now think about that. Soil and water and mountains, these are not just ecosystem services. These are not inert. These are living, breathing things that pulse with the caress of God. And when we start to think that way and use our imaginations that way, that's when we start to make real change. Because who would destroy the caress of God knowingly, right? But we have to make that imaginative shift to get there. And part of that making that imaginative shift is a field called contemplative ecology. This is a, a way of bringing together contemplative practice with ecological ideas and metaphors uh, and the actual science as well. So here's a couple of definitions. Contemplation, I've said, is a long loving look at the real is one definition. Here's another one from Thomas Merton, Trappist monk, another hero of mine. Merton says, the highest expression of humanity's intellectual and spiritual life it is that life itself, fully awake, fully active, fully aware that it is alive. And then ecology is the study of relationships of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. Contemplative ecology is about integrating those spiritual ways of knowing with scientific ways of knowing in service to all of life. And so instead of seeing the earth as a giant warehouse of goods, or even a place that we're supposed to steward, what if we saw the earth as a caress of God? That's the way that God touches us through ecosystems, through the places we live. So I wanna share a few examples of that ecological imagination and contemplative imagination working in tandem. My own education in this area began at Anatoth Community Garden 
community garden that I helped to start in North Carolina, an organic farm and garden for low income families. And through the practices of organic agriculture that we used, we were drawing down carbon out of the atmosphere, putting it back in the soil. You can see the organic matter in that soil is probably 15, 18%, really high organic matter, really rich, high in carbon soil. And this is soil and a way of farming that sequesters and draws down carbon instead of pumping it back into the atmosphere like industrial agriculture does. And you can grow a ton of food doing that. That's, this is one of, another one of the myths is that organic farming can't feed the world. It absolutely can. And it can do it far more efficiently and effectively than industrial agriculture. So this is my own education and how that works. Uh, and as you can see, we grew a lot of food uh, and enjoyed the community work of working together and learning from each other as we did that. In the four years I spent at Anatoth Community Garden in North Carolina, I, I started writing. I'd been writing before that, but I started collecting the stories of these different faith communities who were engaged in uh, carbon friendly agriculture, you might say. And I wrote a couple books, Making Peace with the Land, co authored with my buddy Norman Wiersba, and this book, Soil and Sacrament. And both of these books tell the stories of these different faith communities and how they're reinvigorating their faith through practices of tending the soil, being in contact with that caress of God, the soil and the water. And I wrote about some of these guys, these Trappist monks who were growing oyster mushrooms down in South Carolina. I wrote about Jewish farmers up in Connecticut, raising vegetables, and practicing their Jewish, deepening their Jewish faith through that practice. I wrote about a group in Florida uh, called ECHO, Educational Concerns for Hunger Organization, a Christian nonprofit that acts as a kind of extension agent to the world in tropical regions around the world, teaching uh, smallholder farmers, people on one acre or less often, uh, how to grow organic produce and fruits and vegetables and how to do that in a way that sequesters carbon. Again, carbon-friendly, climate-friendly agriculture at work. I wrote about uh, these gentlemen in Mali, uh, who instead of using uh, fossil fuel-based fertilizer on their maize, they grew acacia trees right here behind them. They're standing in front of an acacia tree. Acacia trees fix nitrogen in the soil. They give free fertilizer taking it out of the air and fixing it in the soil so that those maize plants can, can be fed by the acacia plants. This is carbon-friendly farming at work in the Sahel Desert, one of the most inhospitable places to grow food in the world. So again, it's a myth that you can't feed the world with organic agriculture. I went to Cuba and got to visit Cuban farmers and looked at their organic farming revolution that's happening and has been happening since the fall of the Soviet Union when Cuba's source of agriculture petrochemicals dried up. Uh, they had to figure out overnight, basically, how to farm organically. And I got to learn from those farmers. One of them is a kind of Cuban John Wayne figure. This guy, uh, Miguel Salcines, who's a worm farmer. You can see the worm operation there and, and behind him. And uh, vermicompost is 10 times more effective of a fertilizer than just cow manure. And so they would take cow manure and turn it into vermiculture, vermicompost, use that vermicompost on the gardens that you just saw as fertilizer. So a kind of closed loop system there that keeps, again, keeps the carbon sequestered instead of going into the atmosphere. And looking at this guy, you just gotta say like, he's, he just, I mean, he exudes cool, you know? Like this guy makes me wanna become an organic farmer in Cuba, it's just so I can support that leather jacket and that fedora. Here's another shot of the worm farms of Cuba. I also got to write about a group up in New Hampshire, an Episcopal priest here at the far left of the screen, Reverend Heber, excuse me, Reverend Stephen Blackmer. Did a piece for Harper's Magazine a few years ago about uh, Reverend Blackmer and Oh, he was a former forest ecologist, had a dramatic conversion, became an Episcopal priest, 
and started what's called the Church of the Woods. And so climate action looks, it, there's a lot of different faces of climate action. And I wanna show this is sort of the liturgical face of climate action, if you will. Taking people out into the woods and praying, holding an Episcopal service, having Eucharist. You can see they're having Eucharist there. There's uh, an old maple stump or white pine stump. And this is how you bring, one example I think of bringing the church's liturgy out into creation and reminding us that God is not confined by four walls uh, and reminding us that we are embedded in these ecosystems. They're not separate from us. Church of the Woods, the, the essay is called a priest, The Priest in the Trees. You can see they use the Bible and Mary Oliver, two good companions to have with you. I also got to write about uh, a group of churches in Ethiopia. Uh, before COVID hit, I traveled to Ethiopia last year and wrote about the church forests of Ethiopia. And these church forests are the guardians of essentially the, the last 3% of old growth forest in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, like the US, only has 3% of its remaining old growth forest left. We tend to assume that we have more, but we're seeing secondary and tertiary growth. Most of our old growth forests were cut down long ago or are still being logged in Oregon as we speak. And so like the US, Ethiopia has lost 3% or only has 3% of its remaining old growth forest left. And the church is the guardian of that, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which I think is just a beautiful living metaphor of the church's role in the world to be a guardian of creation, not only to be a shepherd of people, but to be a guardian of God's creation. And so I think we have a lot to learn from our Ethiopian brothers and sisters about doing just that. And here's a few images of these church forests that I got to visit. In Ethiopia, uh, talking with these Orthodox Christians, these monks and nuns and priests there, they will say that the church a church without a forest is like a naked person. A church without a forest is like a person without clothes. And so it's inconceivable to them that churches should not be surrounded by forests. And I just, I love that. Again, that image of the church at the center of this old growth forest and to walk, to get to church, you have to walk through this old growth forest and they're amazing forests. Uh, but they're also threatened, and you can see the farm fields that encroach around them. And so part of the story that I wrote about for Emergence Magazine, it's called The Church Forest of Ethiopia. Uh, pretty pedestrian title, but that's what the editors chose. Uh, these forests are being, uh, there's a, a huge conservation effort, uh, a partnership between Dr. Meg Lauman here in the U.S., an ecologist, and a forest ecologist, Dr. Ali Mayehu Wasi in Ethiopia. Uh, who are raising funds to build walls around these church forests. And you can see, not on these islands, but here you can see a wall. And that's a stone wall, a dry stack stone wall, uh, which keeps out cattle, keeps out grazing animals, allows seedlings in the forest to regenerate and grow. And so it's a wonderful conservation project. It's uh, still very nascent and still in its beginning stages. Uh, but by saving this original genetic material, again, I think this is a, another metaphor for how nature can come back if we allow it to. By saving this genetic material, they're able to replant these trees and to grow these forests. And there have actually been several of these church forests that have expanded their walls. They've actually physically moved their dry stack stone walls outward in order to make room for the new forest that's growing which I think is a beautiful image. So I want to end with just some very practical steps here. This is a, a great book if you're looking to just jump in and learn about solutions to climate change. This is called Drawdown. Sorry, my photography here is a little lacking. I didn't get the full cover. But Drawdown, the subtitle is The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming and it's edited by Paul Hawken. 
And this book has 100 top solutions to climate change. What's going to be the most effective solutions? And they catalog the top 100 solutions. And so number five, right up there at the top, is protecting tropical forests. And so the work uh, that Dr. Miles Selman was doing in the Amazon, for example, and also the work that these Ethiopian Orthodox priests, a climate scientist and a priest, both working on the same issue, protecting tropical forests. So these are, this, this man here is a climate hero. And this is the kind of work that churches need to be engaged in. Plant, eating a plant-rich diet. Instead of meat every day, moving toward less meat and more plants in your diet. Reducing food waste is number three, composting. And these are less sort of sexy. They're onshore wind, wind turbines and refrigerant management. Who would have known? But if you take uh, a look at the book, uh, you'll be inspired, I think, by a lot of the solutions there. And these are things we can all begin to put into practice. Uh, our churches can begin putting them into practice. Uh, in addition to the voting that I hope we will all be doing to vote out the climate deniers so that we can actually begin to make progress instead of moving backwards. I want to end here with a quote to show that this is not some radical idea that I'm proposing or that Pope Francis, that quote from him, this is actually deeply embedded within the Christian tradition, the sense of God being part of all of creation. This is from St. Isaac of Syria, who in the seventh century said this, an elder was once asked, what is a compassionate heart? He replied, it is a heart on fire for the whole of creation, for humanity, for the birds, for the animals, for the demons, and for all that exists. St. Isaac of Syria. And so I want to end there. And just by way of ending, I invite you to just soften your gaze. And let's just end with a few breaths together. Being grateful that we have breath. The Old Testament, there's a wonderful image of God as breath, the Ruach, the spirit that breathes over the waters. Our every breath is sustained by forces beyond us, whatever you believe that to be. And so let's just take a moment to be grateful for that as we sit here breathing. Allowing what's been spoken space to land, to absorb. Breathing in, breathing out, can gently bring your attention back to the room. <laughs>